All right. Good to have you back. This is uh, Jay, Dr. Jay Smith and my good friend, Joe. Joe, how are you? Shalom, Jay. I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me back again. For those of you who don't know who Joe is, he has actually been on this show before we had him out. It was last year, 2020. Am, am I correct, Joe? Yes, that's right. I think the last time I was on was uh, when I was uh, I was in Israel, wasn't I? I was in quarantine in Israel in, in October, I think I was at that time. Over. Okay. And one yeah. of the things about Joe is he speaks very fast and he has lots of ideas. What we are going to do today, however, is we're going to talk about Mecca. The reason why I've just put up the video uh, about Mecca and I took and I introduced Mel from Speak Sneakers Corner, one of his idea as to what or where the Mecca is from the Byzantine Chronicle of 741. So that's one theory uh, that Mecca is up in southern Turkey between what we today is called Edessa and Haran. But what we want to do today is look at another theory. And this is why I've asked Joe to come on board. Now, you might say, well, hold on a minute. Are you contradicting yourself? No, 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 no. Remember, what, is, what, what has been the premise of all the things that we're doing on this channel? Along with Al Fadi's channel, along with my channel, Hatun Tasha's channel, DCCI, we are, and also Joe's channel. Joe, you, you have a channel. Why don't you just introduce your channel real quickly before we go on? Oh, yes, it's uh, Red Judaism, uh, which, uh, um, well, I should probably explain why I, I chose the word Red Judaism, because a lot of people think that that means I'm a, a communist Jew, I suppose. <laughs> which, um, uh, I, I, have, I have socialist tendencies because, of the, because I'm a believer in the Bible and I believe in uh, a, a social support network for the poor and orphans and things like that, of course, as the Bible teaches us. But uh, no, I'm not, a, I'm not a communist, I'm not a Marxist. Um, and red Judaism is actually, a, the reason I chose this phrase is because red in, in Hebrew is Edom. And in Judaism, the term for the for Christianity is Torah Edom, which means the Torah of Edom. That's what we call Christianity in, in Judaism, not in not in Hebrew, in Judaism. So um, red Judaism is basically a kind of indication of some kind of like messianic Judaism sort of ideas. That's the sort of idea that it's 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 it's, it's, it's the idea that uh, that there is a, 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 a an earlier form of of messianic Judaism which existed uh, out of which Christianity and Islam emerged. So that's my channel there. Okay, so that's his theory. Uh, you can see that Joe and I don't necessarily agree on an awful lot of things. We don't agree on our interpretation of scripture. But what we do agree on is that we love history. And what we're interested in is looking at the historical uh, events that happen, looking at the timelines that they happen in, looking at the artifacts that come to fore. And that's what we're going to do today, because we're talking about Mecca. This is whole series uh, where Al Fadi and I have been unpacking: Did Mecca di exist? Did Muhammad exist? Did people called Muslims or a religion called Islam exist? Did the Quran exist? Those are the five things that we've been unpacking in this series. We're now at Mecca. We're asking this question about Mecca, and I've had Mel's material yesterday. What I want to do today is go to Joe's material. Now, obviously, you you. Some of you might say, are, are, are they, are they going to cancel each other out? No, no, no. The reason why we have to do this is because we need to follow where the evidence leads. And yesterday, when we put, uh, put up the material on the Chronicle, the Byzantine Chronicle, 740, written in 741, we asked the question whether or not Patricia Kroner went far enough. Did she look at the entire phrase? Did she look at the entire quote? Or she just look at the word Mecca and assume that that's the Mecca of the Hejaz, the central part of Arabia? That's the assumption she made when she wrote about this in 1987 in her book called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. So because of that, we uh, those of us who are on this team that are trying to unpack the seventh century, we said, why didn't she read the whole quote? Because the whole quote says more than just the word Mecca. I had Mel's uh, criteria yesterday. We're now going to move to Joe's criteria. And let's see what Joe has found, because you're going to see that 
that phrase needs to be unpacked even more. So Joe, you are here and you have a PowerPoint. So let's go ahead and put up your PowerPoint. It's just, I think two or three slides or four slides at the most. It's not very much, but you're gonna show us that there may be another way to unpack that phrase, another way to look at the geography, another way to actually look at a map and see where this place was that was called Mecca in 741. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jay. I'm just trying to find that. I hope that's going to share now. Here we go. All right, so um, Mecca. Now I just put up here the word at the top here, Mecca. I spelt it with one K and uh, just M-A-K-A-H because that is the word as it appears in the, uh, you know, I always want to avoid uh, the Abbasid sources. I want to always go back to the Umayyad sources um, and in the Umayyad uh, copies of the Quran, that's how it appears like this. It doesn't yeah, have... Uh, people who may not know what you're saying. I'll just interrupt you real quickly. Yes. The Umayyad are the, were in power from 661 up until 749 and the Abbasids took over and they could go from 749 right, right on up after that. But the Abbasids hated the Umayyads. The Abbasids come first. They are headquartered in Damascus. That's their political headquarters. And the Abbasids, who are Persian in background, were headquartered in what was then called Stesiphon, but then became Baghdad later on. Mm -hmm. That's right. So basically what we've got at the top here is the Umayyad Makkah, and underneath versus the Abbasid Mecca, uh, also spelled Makkah, but there you see the difference in spelling also. They've got a lot, they put a double K over, see these little marks over called Haraka, and uh, over the those Arabic those letters. Are, this those is those a, are called Fatta. That's the, yeah. actually, that's the vowel Fatta. That's the R vowel. That one, that Fatta is double, yeah, exactly. Means it's doubled, it's doubled. It's yes, twice. yes. That's right. So we've got M, K, and H, essentially. And here you have those markings as well, which are also uh, Kirat markings as well. Uh, six, six, Kirat markings. In, can, in, can, in cantillation in the markings. The 8th century. So this would not be the 600s. This would be the 700s where those were introduced. So there's essentially two different words. Uh, one is the Abbasid word, and one is the Umayyad word. And I, I put it like that because, in fact, if we're looking for the early Mecca, we should actually always look for the Umayyad word, not for the Abbasid word. But nevertheless, we still can't find anything except uh, one source. So this, this is the earliest source for the origin of the word Quran in the Umayyad, uh, what you could say, um, fragments of the Quran. Uh, chapter 48, verse 24, this word appears out of nowhere. Nobody knows what it's about. It, it looks like that. And in fact, even these two dots are missing, but I couldn't get it without the two dots. It just looks like this, and nobody even knows what it's talking about. Um, it says that there's some kind of, um, there was some kind of uh, battle averted. If you look at uh, Quran 48, 24, it says that they, they with the hands were withheld from each other in the Batin Mecca, which, which could mean the Valley of Mecca or the, the Basin of Mecca. Something, some kind of conflict between the believers and uh, some kind of non-believers was avoided uh, in this place called Mecca and uh, as a result of that, the believers were able to get their offerings to the um, inviolable place of worship or the Masjid al-Haram, but and something was that. hampering from- I've got it yeah. right here. Why don't I read it out, yeah. sir? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Now, this is from sure. the Hidali and Khan, uh, a yeah. translation. And he it is who has withheld their hands from you and your hands from them. In this translation, it says, in the midst of Mecca, after he mm -hmm. had made you victors over them. So you're right, it's a battle. There's, he's made you victors over them. And Allah is ever all seer of what you do. Then verse 25, they are the ones who disbelieved and hindered you from the Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Masjid Al-Haram right. means the place, the, the forbidden place of bowing and detain the sacrificial animals from reaching their place of sacrifice. Had there not been believing men and believing women whom you did not know that you may kill them and on whose account a sin would have been committed by you without knowledge that Allah might bring into his mercy whom he wills if they had been apart. We verily would have punished those of them who disbelieved with painful torment. Okay. So it's not really clear, but there's some, some kind of conflict which was uh, avoided in this place. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the conflict was because in this place there were people who were trying to who who were somehow hindering 
their um, offerings from getting to the uh, uh, the the Al Masjid Al Haram, the, the the inviolable place of worship, wherever that was. And there's no indication that that was in Makkah. So Makkah and the inviolable place place of worship should not be equated as the same place. Neither the Kaaba in the same place nor the Qibla in the same place. But there was this place called Makkah, and that's all we know about it. Seems like at a later date they were all amalgamated into one place. But um, at this point, all that we know is that there was some kind of um, conflict which was avoided in this place and that it was a button Mecca, uh, or as it said, the, the, in the midst of Mecca or the center of Mecca or the middle of Mecca, um, or it could be the valley of Mecca, the basin of Mecca, there, it, there were different ways of interpreting it. The word button can also mean secret. So in the secret of Mecca, um, it can mean womb. So it's not very clear where or what it was but there was something that was avoided there and that's all we really know about it so that's the that's the that's the beginning of the mystery mm. uh, from nowhere we hear about this avoided battle so uh, as i mentioned in a makkah um actually i can't see all of my words because there's something over here but basically the, the so the word is part of the phrase meaning makkah implying that makkah was was a larger uh, uh area and even the inner part of Mecca was big enough uh, to hold a potential conflict against infidels where, who, who hindered the believers concerning uh, the Masjid al-Haram and prevented their offerings from reaching their destination. So as uh, Dr. J just read out for us there. The point is, uh, Batin Mecca, inner Mecca, or possibly the Valley of Mecca, uh, the womb of Mecca, it's a larger area, maybe something which uh, this inner part is is named after, um, and uh, that's quite in, important, I think. So we can't be talking about just a, uh, say, for example, a roadside shrine. For example, it's if 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 the, if Makkah was a roadside shrine, then you wouldn't be able to have a conflict on the inner part of Makkah. You understand what I'm trying to say? So uh, it's got to be, I think, at least the size of a uh, of a of a cathedral. So, uh, so that you can have, or uh, I think a cathedral is, is, is probably the smallest it could be, so that you could have um, two parties about to have a conflict be being between each other in, in the inner part. So the, the inner part of Mecca, the inner part or the Batin part of Mecca has to be at least the size of a cathedral. That's my theory. I mean, it's not really conceivable to imagine a, a, a house where you've got two parties about to have a, 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 some kind of a, a conflict between each other. I mean, two families maybe, but they're talking about the believers versus the disbelievers. So I don't think you could get all the believers in, in one house and all the disbelievers in one house. So I'm thinking maybe something the size of a cathedral would be the inner Makkah. And then as for the rest of Makkah, God knows how big that could have been. Um, it might be that there was no uh, bigger Makkah. It might be that the inner Makkah was all there was. It was pointed out to me, that Batin Makkah could actually just be the real name, that what we're thinking of as Makkah being the name and inner Makkah might actually be a mistake. It might be just one word, Batin Makkah, might be the correct name for the place we're looking for. It might actually be called Batin Makkah because he was from Iraq and he pointed out to me that they have plenty of Batin such and such, Batin this, Batin that in Iraq. And so Batin Makkah could just be another name of a place. But if it's not uh, Batin Makkah, if Batin Makkah is not the name, if Makkah is the name, then we uh, can imagine that justifiably that uh, Makkah would have been a bigger area and that Batin Makkah would be a smaller part of that bigger area. So it's got to be something large enough. Uh, it can't be a roadside shrine or a house or something like that. So uh, that's all we've got from this point. So where, where could, might it be? Okay, so we get this uh, the idea of where it is from the Byzantine Arab Chronicle of 741 AD, which uh, Dr. J mentioned uh, Patricia Crone quoted from, but she only quoted a very small part of it. It's, the context is that Abdul Malik uh, ibn Marwan um, was expanding his kingdom and he chased Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr, um, whom, whom his father had attacked on, uh, on so many times in various wars, all the way, finally, let me just yes. interrupt here very quickly. Uh, yes. So for those who we know, who just to give some historical context, who is Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan? This is the king uh, who lived up in Damascus. He was Umayyad. 
He was the second in the Marwan family, and he ruled from 685 to 705. We've talked about him many times. Uh, we had Murad come on and talk about the Dome of the Rock. He was the one that built the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. So he's very famous. We know all about him, and he did not like Zubair, or Zubair did not like him. And so we've talked about Zubair as well. So put that into historical context. We're talking about now Abdul Malik, who's living in Damascus, and Zubair, who is his governor, who is now rebelling against him. Back over to you again. Thank you. Um, and the other thing about in, interesting to compare their coins, since they're fighting each other, I think it's really important to, if you can, uh, bring up and put, put a picture of their coins, a, a coin of Abdul Malik. His style is what we call Byzantine Arab style. And oh, then a coin of- coin Right here, here comes his coin. There you go. The way I understand it is that the first coins of Abdul Malik are um, what we call Byzantine Arab style coins. And um, uh, they they're gold, uh, uh, and he they they, they imitate uh, the Byzantine style. They they, they sort of have right. this uh, Abdul Malik. He conquers uh, Ibn al Abdullah Ibn al Zubayr, and he adopts uh, Ibn al Zubayr's style. Uh, Ibn al Zubayr's coins look like this. If you have one, you can put yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. And you can see that that's very Zoroastrian, typical Sasanian coin, with the slight difference that it's got Bismillah written on the core, on the side of it. But otherwise, it's uh, indistinguishable from a regular sort of Sasanian coin. Okay. Um, and Abdul Malik adopts that style. There is this sort of uh, style that is uh, this Arab Byzantine style, which is Abdul Malik. And meanwhile, Ibn al Zubayr has got this Arab Sasanian style. Then Abdul Malik conquers uh, Ibn al Zubayr. And then he adopts an Arab Sassanian style and then very quickly changes his mind and brings in this uh, Islamic style. So uh, I think observing the coins and understanding this record, the Byzantine Arab Chronicle here is very important because I think it shows two different kingdoms. One was in what we call the Arab Sassanian kingdom of Ibn al-Zubayr, Arab Sassanian, Arab Sassanian by the way. So Ibn al-Zubayr is supposed to be, according to the Abbasid, Abbasid narrative, Ibn al-Zubayr is supposed to be way down thousands of miles to the south in Mecca in Hijaz, and yet his coin is Arab Sassanian coin being minted in, in, in Persia. So um, that's quite interesting that uh, the, uh, Ibn al-Zubayr's coins are Arab Sassanian, uh, Abdul Malik's coins are Arab Byzantine style, um, very, very similar to the, the coins of uh, Ma, uh, 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 Muawiyah before him. And then he conquers Ibn al, uh, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. He adopts this style briefly with some quite significant changes on the back. Um, and then replaces it with the standard Islamic coin, which, which, the, which, which continues until, uh, well, it continues for hundreds of years after that. So, um, so it's like uh, he conquered these people and then decided that he was going to try and have a, 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 a try to, adopt their style, but then eventually decides to have one new style to unite the empire. The two sides of the empire are united under a new style, new religion, new book, new coins, everything's new. And uh, 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 Dr. J. Smith is showing you the coins, the new coins there um, uh, for the new Islamic uh, empire, which he's, he, he brings about. But the important point, if I'll get back up to this Byzantine Arabic chronicle, um, is that it says that when he went to went against Ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr, that he went, and it's in there in blue writing, all the way to Mecca, as they consider it, the home of Abraham, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. So that's the important uh, thing there. So he chased Ibn uh, al-Zubayr, uh, he chased him all the way finally to Mecca, as they consider it the home of Abraham. So Mecca, the place that the Arabs consider to be the home of Abraham, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. Now, the sort of standard uh, uh, Dawa sort of explanation of this source, because they like this source. It's a proof of the early source, an always early source proving, proving the existence of Mecca. Uh, and the standard explanation that they give is that they like to say that this part, the home of Abraham, okay, which, uh, sorry, the, all the way to Mecca, as they consider it, the home of Abraham, 
which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. What they like to say is that this phrase, uh, the home of Abraham, is what the Byzantine Arab Chronicle is saying, lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. Therefore, they're saying that this entire clause from the, here, the home of Abraham until the end, they say that that's irrelevant to the location of Makkah. That's the standard dawah sort of interpretation of this verse. Well, there's a big problem with that standard dawah, dawah sort of interpretation of this verse, because uh, the Byzantines, it, 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 it relies on understanding that the Byzantines considered the home of Abraham to between, be between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara. I'll repeat that. They want us to believe that the Byzantines are the ones who believed that the home of Abraham was between Ur of the Chaldeans, between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara. Does anybody see a problem with that? Jay, do you see the problem with that? Well, I see it right away because you're not looking at the phrase as it's written. Yeah, they're, 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 the first of all, they're taking, taking, first of all, they're taking the phrase not as it's written, right. And also, there's a second problem is that's a huge amount of, that's a huge clause, which is irrelevant to be added on to the immediately after Mecca. But the, the other point here is that Ur of the Chaldeans is the home of Abraham. <laughs> so according to the Judeo-Christian tradition, Ur of the Chaldeans is the home of Abraham. So why would the Byzantines be saying that the home of Abraham is between the home of Abraham and Kara? So as they consider it the home of Abraham, is Mecca. Therefore, this comment here, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldees and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia, is a clear explanation from the Byzantine Arab Chronicle of 741 AD. This is an, an Umayyad time source. Before the Abbasids got a chance to change the story, that is exactly where the Arabs believed uh, Mecca was. They believed it was between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. So as you mentioned before, all we have to do is identify where is Ur of the Chaldeans and where is Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. And between the two, that is where we are going to find Mecca, which is the home of Abraham being spoken of here, the home of Abraham according to the Arabs. Yeah. So right? basically what you're saying is we need to be careful of dais today, Muslim dais, who want to look at that phrase and try to convolute or they stop it after it and they put the this next phrase as a separate phrase whereas if you just read this visiting chronicle it's very clear that mecca is between ur of chaldea and kara the city of mesopotamia right and the important the important point here is to understand that that's ur of the chaldeans i mean look where where, where do we know ur of the chaldeans from it's in the bible it's in the what's bible. it that's talking about it's, it's always the case you're right it's, it's the home of Abraham. Ur of the Chaldeans is the is the Judeo-Christian home of Abraham. That's where Abraham's from, Ur of the Chaldeans. If Byzantines would be Christian, therefore, that's why if this is a Byzantine chronicle, that's what they're that's what they mean by this. Yeah, so they're basically saying that the Arabs' home of Abraham is between our home of Abraham and Kara. That's what they're saying. The Arabs' home of Abraham is between our Judeo-Christian home of Abraham and Kara. So all you have to do is identify where is the Judeo-Christian home of Abraham and Kara, and then you know between those two places is where the Arabs in the 741 AD, where the Arabs considered Mecca to be. It's actually a slam dunk. It's actually, it's, it's actually all you have to do. So the, the problem is there's a big conflict over the identification of where is or of the Chaldeans. Kara is pretty much accepted generally. I think everybody accepted it's Haran. But Ur of the Chaldeans, there's a conflict which arose, and it's interesting to think. Repeat uh, what you just said again. I don't think people would have picked that up. Repeat what you just said. About, about Kara being Haran? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty much accepted that Kara is Haran. Now, uh, how do you come to that conclusion? Because I'm not, I'm not sure most of people will understand why, why, why you can put the two together. Well, it's just that if, if you look up the references to Kara, you'll find there are there, there are plenty of uh, encyclopedic references to Kara being Haran. There's plenty of there are plenty of academic uh, papers which mention Kara being Haran. Um, it's it's pretty much general establishment accepts that Kara is Haran. Now, I mean, there are there is another possible to help people out just to help people out that Kara and Haran. Haran, uh, the place where I read that Haran is between is in the Mesopotamia. That means it is between the, the two great rivers. 
that would be Tigris. But this, yes, remember that Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans and he went to um, to to Haran, and his brother died in Haran, which is where where he was named after him. Probably. We need to find Kara, and Kara would between the two rivers, a uh, city in Mesopotamia, and I, I help people understand what is the word Mesopotamia. How do you translate that word? What does it mean? Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers, between the rivers. There it is. Mesopotamia. Oh, look, at, you're going to show a map, I hope, because you need to look and see yeah. where Haran is. Yeah. So I'll just point up here. Here is Haran, up okay. here in the corner. Now, can you also point um, out where the Tigris is and where the Euphrates are, is? All right. So this river up here in the corner, coming up here, coming down here, this is the Tigris River. Okay, in the north. And this river, this river on this side of Haran, coming down here, is the, t right. the, the Euphrates. So you that's Mesopotamia. Right. This is really the cradle of civilization, isn't it? This is where so many great empires yeah. grew yeah. and fell, grew and fell because of those two rivers. And that's why so much of both, both the biblical narrative and also the Quran Quranic narrative all takes place up here because this is where people live. This is where all the fertile country yeah. is because of those main it rivers. All, it is all happening here. So Abraham left a place we were going to talk about where is it? Ur of the Chaldees. Um, and he arrived eventually at Haran up here where his brother died. And then he and his brother's son Lot uh, and the, the people went down to Canaan, which is not on the map here, which is uh, have it on the map. The modern, yeah, go ahead and take, mo take, modern, take modern state. So they, they left Haran, Haran where his brother died and he went with um, uh, his brother's son Lot. Uh, and they went down to Canaan, which is with the, where the modern state of Israel is today so that's uh that's where haran is up here just on the um what side of that just on the uh, the right bank the right side of the euphrates river between it's in it's in yeah, yeah the east is eastern side of the euphrates inside of what we call classical sort of mesopotamia between the two rivers between the euphrates river and the tigris river so this entire area of, is mesopotamia and haran is the famous city of mesopotamia so so that's the source there, um, and it says that uh, the, 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 the city of Maka is between that Haran, Kara, the city of Mesopotamia, and the Judeo-Christian home of Abraham, which is called Ur of the Chaldees. So the Judeo-Christian home of Abraham is not the same as the Arab home of Abraham, which they say is Maka. Well, that's that's right. And in fact, there's been a, a, a debate on, 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 on the location uh, because it, it was lost. But we do need, I mean, obviously, they wouldn't have been trying to find Ur of, uh, of the Chaldees unless uh, the tradition had been lost uh, to the Western world. So in order to find out where the Byzantines believed uh, Ur of the Chaldees was, we have to go to early Byzantine sources. <clears throat> now, I happen to have found one, uh, which is on the next slide here. So it's called the Journey of Ageria. It's from the fourth century AD. And this is a Byzantine source on where they believed Ur of the Chaldees, the home of Abraham, was, okay? Uh, and it says, so I also asked the Holy Bishop, where is that place of Ur of the Chaldees where Terah lived at first with his family? And the Holy Bishop said to me, the place daughter which, of which you ask is at the 10th station from here, as you go towards Perg Persia, into Persia. There are st five stations from here uh, to Nisbis and five stations thence from Nisbis to Hur, which was a city of the Chaldees. But there is now no access for Romans, for the Persians hold the whole country. This district in particular is called Orientalis. It is on the borders of the Romans, the Persians, and the Chaldees. Now, the, 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 the pilgrim, Ageria, who's a, a, a lady who was uh, doing a pilgrimage way back in the fourth century, um, uh, has arrived in Haran and uh, on her pilgrimage, Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. And she's talking to the Bishop of Haran and wanting to find out where is Ur of the Chaldees, where Terah lived with his family, the homeland, the home of Abraham. Terah is the father of Abraham. So the family of Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees. This is the Byzantine belief at, at that time. Mm -hmm. So they want, she's wanting to find out how to get there. And he says that it's 10 stations from here 10 stations hence, uh, that's here being Haran, where they are, which we saw on the map just now, up here. 10 stations from Haran, towards Persia, 
Persia is in this direction, not this direction, not this direction, not north, south, east. Sorry, it's not north, it's not south, it's not west, it's east. So 10 stations towards the east from Haran uh, is where um, uh, uh, is or where Ur of the Chaldees is, the home of Abraham. Um, Can I just jump in here? Yes. Are we suggesting stations means where you would go for one day's walk, then you'd sleep overnight, that's one station. One day's walk, you sleep overnight, or camel's journey. Is that what we're talking about, stations? So these are places like oases along the way. These are places for, for each for a, a pilgrim to go. Is that what I'm thinking? Yes, I think they're resting stations. And 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 she gives the he gives the exact distance of, of that, saying that from Haran to Nisibis is five stations. So on the map here, we're looking, here's Haran up here, and here is Nusaibin, which is Nisibis. Okay, and that's, that's quite a long day. distance. Just so people don't get confused, that's the modern day spell uh, name for what was then in the eighth century Nisibis. Remember, cities yes. change names all the time. Just be yes. aware of that. We've already mentioned Stesiphon became Baghdad. We, we mentioned that Yathrib became Medina. So this is quite normal where Nisibis would now be Nusaibin. Yes, Nusaibin. And in the Islamic sources, it's called Nusaib as well. So um, that's the Abbasid sources. So Nusaibin uh, was what the Byzantines called Nisibis. And the distance between Haram and Nisibis was five stations. So that's five stations distance, uh, the tra traveling five stations from Has Haram to Nisibis, the side. Okay, so we get a rough idea of the distance, but there's, there, there's no, no clear idea of, of how many stations it is, but, but, but at least we can, we can understand that the distance uh, of a station is, is not, a, not a small matter. It's a, it's a large amount of traveling that you can do in a, in, in a in a day or maybe maybe more uh, because this is quite a long journey so there we go so let's just even off at 150 miles and that's five stations so 150 divided by five we've basically got 30 miles maybe a station 30 what miles it sounds like a can easily do in a day a day's journey so maybe a, a 30 30 miles uh, maybe a day's journey so that's a station okay so maybe a station we can understand as a, a place to sleep overnight before you go on and carry on the next day so uh, 30 miles a station, 150 miles, that's five stations to Nisbis. So it's quite a good distance. Uh, okay, so, um, and then he says that from Nisbis, it's the Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham's Ur of the Chaldees, according to the Byzantine uh, tradition, which is the same tradition which wrote the Byzantine Arab Chronicle, where it says Mecca was between Ur of the Chaldees and Kara and Haran. So the same Byzantine tradition, Byzantine church tradition, is that Ur of the Chaldees is another five stations from Nisbis, and it gives us some idea of, of which direction to go from. But I actually drew this little line there, for five stations from Nisbis. Uh, let me just move this out of the way. Five stations from Nisbis, and I've got the same distance. That's another 150 miles green line. I've done it down going towards the, the, towards the Tigris. But it's going to be the same sort of distance from there. Now, uh, I did it in that direction. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of common sense before we even read what the bishop tells us about the direction. There's a little bit of common sense tells us that, for example, you're not going to go five stations to Nisbis and then double back on yourselves and go five stations, say, for example, down towards the, the southwest. You know, why would you go all the way to Nisbis and then five stations down towards the southwest when you could have just gone from Haran down Haran down the Euphrates River, you, you see, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense that that it would be from Nis, Nisbis then going back another five stations towards or uh, you the southwest, the, Khab the Khabur River, which goes or to go down the Khabur River from Nisbis. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you'd go down the Khabur River. I mean, you you go to Nisbis and then you'd have to go back down the Khabur River. Why not just go along the, the Khabur River immediately? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so some common sense can be taken with what the bishop is saying. He's saying you've got to go to Nisbis first because Ur of the Chaldees is, is further on from there. So we can get a kind of a rational sort of understanding of, of why it's going to be probably, if I draw a line straight down from Nisbis, straight down the middle of the page here, why it's got to be on the, on the right-hand side of this screen or the rather than side. any... The eastern yeah. side. So the eastern side of this, of Nisbis, why it's got to be over here rather than anywhere 
on the uh, on the on the western side of the screen if you draw a straight line down from this piece there's some common sense which makes it makes sense of that likewise it's not going to be anywhere to the north in that quarter so if you think about quadrants it's not going to be in the northern quarter north it's not being the northwest quadrant from this piece it's not going to be in the southwest quadrant from this piece it could be for in the in the northeast quadrant from this piece or the southeast quadrant from this piece but it's not going to be in the uh, in those western quadrants so there's some common sense already but then the, the bishop well, does give just, us further details. Here. Yes. It would have to yes. be between the Tigris and Euphrates. You could not go. You could not go to the northeast because that would be outside of the Tigris Euphrates. Right. Mesopotamia. So you have to remain right. in Mesopotamia. You have to be between those right. two rivers. Right. Right. That's also common sense too. So, but let's go back and read what else the bishop says about the direction. Okay. So back to the. Um, uh, the bishop's writings. What he's saying. Uh, the, the the bishop's description. So it's five stations from Nisbis, Nusaybin, to Hur. And Hur is Ur, by the way. Again, just uh, the H is, is, is optional in Greek. If anybody studied Greek, you'll know that it's a aspiration over the, over the letter. It can be uh, translated with an H or not. It, it doesn't have to be there. So this is Ur. Um, so it's five stations from Nisbis, Nusaybin, to Ur, which was the city of the Chaldees. And he says, but there is now no access for Romans for the Persians hold the whole country. So it's it's going to be easy to get a fourth century map, which I haven't been able to track down, but we, can, we, could, we could do a little bit more research to narrow it down. And we could get a map of the Persian Empire and the, and the, um, the Byzantine Empire in the fourth century. And we'll know uh, the rough boundaries of, of where the Persians were. And we'll know that this, these five stations from Nisibis have to be inside of Persia because he said, the bishop says that this area, or of the Chaldees, is now under the control of the Persians. <clears throat> Even though the Persians are- I'm putting the map yes. up now, okay? So that's a map of where the borders were, according to the records that we have, stating uh, the Roman and Persian uh, empires in the fourth century. So if they had maps in the fourth century, that's roughly what it might look like if they were able to have fantastic cartography. Just as an um, aside, real quickly, you know that maps really come into play only in the 14th and 15th century. So these, all the maps that we have for ancient uh, era are what people have written in their journals. Right. And then usually right. they, you find, you put the reason why they are able to make maps is because they talk about, uh, they talk about this mountain or that river or this plain or they, they talk about topographical area uh, uh, distinctions of where these cities are, or these places are, or this road is, or borders are. And a lot of times borders follow, follow rivers back at that. So, and then people in the 14th and the 15th century then made maps. So the maps um, sometimes are correct, sometimes they're not correct, but you, they can only go on like what you see right here. Here's a fourth century reference point. You would then try to pick a map. This is what we think looks like the, the map would look like back then right there's there's always a room for error and further research on on uh, re redrawing historical maps from such uh, entries from such descriptions um but uh, there's been a lot of work done on such things for an awfully long time it's it's part of the, the classical uh, studies and it's 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 a, a, a lot of people have been interested in uh the borders between persia and and rome so um we can assume that the experts in their fields are, are, are not too far off when they've drawn up these maps reconstructing where they consider the borders of, of Rome and, the, and, the, and the, the Persians may have been in the fourth century. It's, it's, it, there's, there's always room for error and further research, but it's going to be roughly uh, right. I think we, 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 we're pretty safe to say that that's, that's about right. So we're looking for something inside of the Persian borders of that time. Okay, but the um, bishop even goes further. He goes even further <clears throat> and he says that this district in particular is called Orientalis. Now, Orientalis is usually translated as the East, but it's actually a proper name, just like Mesopotamia is a proper name. You don't translate Mesopotamia, uh, which is the name of a name of a province. You don't, pro you don't translate the name of the province and call it Between Rivers. It's called Mesopotamia. That's the proper name of a place of a province called Mesopotamia, which literally means between rivers. Um, so we have a district, a proper name of a district, a real district, which was called Orientalis. That's the original word in the original source given, Orientalis. 
uh, and the case is there, it's clear too. It's, it's not correct to translate Orientalis into English as the East. Uh, that would be as wrong as translating Mesopotamia into English as between rivers. It's a proper name of a proper district, Orientalis. And if you're interested, the Oriental Orthodox Church is named after this province, Orientalis, because a lot of people were confused. Why do we have a, a church called the Oriental Orthodox Church? And why do we have a church called the Eastern Orthodox Church? Aren't, when Orientalis means Eastern, so it's the same thing, right? But it's because the Eastern Orthodox Church, or just simply the Orthodox Church, Byzantine Church, um, is not named after the province or the district of Orientalis, which was a, a entirely uh, 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 a, 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 a sort of a monophysite area. Very important to mention that monophysite because that comes a lot, uh, up a lot in, in, my, in my research in particular, and we'll talk about, about that more later. But it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a very um, strongly held by Syriac Orthodox Christians and uh, Armenian Orthodox Christians. Both these churches are what we call part of the Oriental Orthodox Church because of Orientalis. So it's a province or a district called Orientalis. And Orientalis was traditionally, this is obviously a, a, a Roman name for its, um, and it is on the borders of the Romans, the Persians, and the Chaldees. Now we know that the area is currently held by the Persians, but the bishop is saying that there is a traditional border of Persian, which is which obviously Persia has overstepped its traditional borders by the time the bishop is speaking. But the traditional borders of Persia and the Romans and the Chaldees, where the three meet, that is where the district called Orientalis is. So the district called Orientalis is on the border of these three traditional areas, the Romans, the Persians, and the Chaldees. The Chaldees are not in the north, so we're looking to the south. So let's look at the map. So we've got our clues, we've got our clues. We know that it's five stations from Nisbis, Nusaybin, towards Persia, as he says, uh, um, as you go into Persia. So you're going towards Persia, and he means as you're going into the traditional borders of Persia. So it's going from Nusaybis towards Persia, which is down this direction, sort of the south southeast towards Persia. Persia Polis is down there, way down there. Um, we know that this area has been conquered by the Persians, but is actually an area where there used to be a, a Roman Empire border, a Persian border, and a Chaldean border. So Chaldees have been uh, to the south, not in the north of Nusaybin. So we know that there are no Chaldees in the, in the north north of Nusaybis, uh, Nisbis. There are no Chaldees to the north of Nisbis for thousands and thousands of years. The, the Chaldees have been down the south there. So we're looking towards the south part of Mesopotamia for the border of the Chaldees. So coming up somewhere from the south, the border of the Chaldees, uh, where the Chaldees would meet the border of the Romans and their extent over Mesopotamia and the province called Orientalis, and where the traditional borders of Persia were, somewhere where the three meet is where we're going to find uh, the uh, Byzantine tradition on where Ur of the Chaldees was. And it's going to be about uh, 150 miles in that direction. So you can see where my mouse is going, going around, my, my, my cursor. It's going to be around here somewhere. I drew the line going from Nisbis down to Mosul um, originally, because that's actually the same distance from Haran to Nisbis. But you see that following the directions or the instructions that the bishop has given us, it's going to be in this area somewhere. And it's quite interesting because it's coming quite close to this place called Sinjar. And Sinjar is very, very important and significant. Uh, from Jewish tradition, because it is the plain of Shinar, which is where they built the Tower of Babel, according to Jewish tradition. Um, and of course, there was the episode with Nimrod and the tradition of Abraham uh, confronting Nimrod um, at, 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 over the Tower of Babel. And so that is all happening exactly, roughly. I mean, it's not too far away from where the bishop is, is describing uh, the, the location of where we can find or of the Chaldees, according to Byzantine tradition, which means that the Byzantines 
are preserving again the Judeo-Christian Jew, uh, Jewish tradition also that that the home of Abraham was on the plain of Shinar, which is uh, where we have Shinjar. Sinjar here is the plain of Shinar. It's somewhere around here is going to be the plain of Shinar. It could be Tel Afar, maybe that's the 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 or of the Chaldees. It's it's somewhere along here. So although it's lost and we don't know exactly where it is, we've got a rough idea, quite good directions from that uh, journal telling us where Ur of the Chaldees was according to Byzantine tradition, which also, uh, uh, Byzantine church tradition, which also ties in with uh, the Jewish tradition on where Ur of the Chaldees was. So the home of Abraham from the Judeo-Christian tradition is somewhere where I'm circling my mouse up here. So, as, am, am, am I clear? Is that is that is that That's clear to easy me. to understand? Yeah, I can clear see what you? you're doing. The fact that we've got this city called Tal Afar is interesting because Tal is a Chaldean word, uh, and same in Hebrew, Tel uh, it means city. So. Uh, that's not an Arabic word there. Tal is not an Arabic word. So that's interesting. So we do have some evidence of Chaldeans in the area. So um, I think that's uh, pretty much getting a clear idea of where Ur of the Chaldees would be on the plain of Shinar in this part of Mesopotamia and the area which is described as called Orientalis. So now let's go back to that first uh, Arab Byzantine chronicle of 741. Now we know where Ur of the Chaldees was. And we know that Mecca, the home of Abraham for the Arabs, is between Ur of the Chaldees, the home of the Abraham for the Byzantine and, uh, well, Judeo-Christian tradition, between that Ur and Haran. So all we have to do is basically draw a line between Ur of the Chaldees area, which is in this Orientalis area, on the plain of Shinar, between Shinar, the plain of Shinar, and Hara, Haran, and we should be able to find the rough location of where Mecca was. Are we ready to do that? There we go. So here we go. So here we have the plain of Shinar. There's Sinjar itself, which is Shinar, the plain of Shinar, where somewhere the, the home of Abraham was, or the Chaldees is somewhere around here. So all we have to do is draw a line from here all the way to Haram. And somewhere between them, which is actually here, we should be able to find Mecca. So it should be here. Is that is that fair enough? Is that clear enough? I think that's clear enough. Yeah, yeah, no, that's clear enough to me. So you're talking about really, you're talking about the river of Nar al Khabur, which is the name today. That's right. Nahal yep. Nar is the modern name for that river that, that's right there, almost uh -oh. equal distance between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And then it, it then joins the Euphrates further down south at Al. It is indeed. It is indeed. It's almost equidistant. And that brings us back to this uh, interesting phrase. Remember, we talked about Batin, Inner Mecca, is translated as Inner Mecca. But my Iraqi friend uh, reminded me that Batin can also must mean valley, as in a river valley. So that would be absolutely perfect for Batin Mecca if Batin Mecca was a river valley in this area. Now, we've got a problem of trying to locate Mecca. And uh, this was. Uh, uh, pointed out by uh, Jay to me earlier. The problem is that there is a, a reservoir here now. <laughs> so if there is a city of Mecca or, or an area of Mecca to be investigated. Let's just show the could... dam. We'll just show the dam. Yeah. I'll bring up here. Take a look. Dam. Here's the dam. That is a modern yep. dam. That dam has now fill, filled up that entire valley with water, which is fine. That's where you need to have water in a desert place yep. like that. And that's why much of that whole area now is underwater. There are no, uh, there's no way we could go to find any old buildings or any old artifacts anymore. Uh, no, no one's moaning that, but we should not expect to find, if there is a Mecca there, we should not expect to find Mecca today. And least of all, we're, we're not going to be able to dig up um, uh, graves and find out about anything that was happening, you know, pottery shards. Of course, they need water. I mean, they need to, they, they, it, it's a dry area. They need to be able to manage their water supplies, but uh, it just puts a massive uh, block, a big stop sign on our research to try and locate the original Maka, which is probably around this area. Well, Another thing to bear in mind. May I just yes? jump into this though? I mean, that's not to say, listen, you're the first to come up with this theory. No one's bothered to see if Mecca's there. 
we're talking about 2021 is where you're now introducing this idea, Joe. It could be that now people need to go and start looking and see maybe north of the, of the, uh, of the lake, that there could be. Well, a, interesting a, a enough. We might be able to find say, Al Hasaka in that area. Maybe just a little bit further north of Al Hasaka is actually a city called Medina. <laughs> so, a town called Medina, which might be very worthwhile doing some research on, on, on that, because that could be the, the Medina, which was north of Mecca. You never know. Um, it's not as far a distance as the Abbasids would have us believe from Mecca, but it's, uh, it's up there. On the other hand, there's another place called Yathrib, which is further down here. Uh, and of course, Medina can also just mean state. So the whole state uh, of the, the, the Arab Empire could have been Medina. Mecca could have been part of Medina, Yathrib could have been part of Medina. It just means state. So, but uh, anyway, it's it. If we follow the the those two Byzantine sources, uh, one of them is a Byzantine source telling us where the Arabs believed the home of Abraham Mecca was, and the other is a Byzantine source telling us where the Byzantines and the uh, subsequent we, we discover that's also exactly where the Jews say uh, the home of Abraham was on the plain of Shinar. Between the two is here the Khabur. Uh, river valley which uh, has a dam on it and may not be possible to excavate or research but maybe other places might be um, and that does fit with this definition of batin batin being also another way for a valley so a word for a valley so that could be the valley of Mecca which we're talking about and there may have been some kind of uh, group which was obstructing pilgrims from god knows where from getting their going on their way on their pilgrimage towards the masjid al-haram which is probably in down in this direction somewhere <clears throat> and uh, that could be uh, that that could be what was happening. Uh, there may be Medina up here worthwhile investigating. But the other issue which is preventing research and archaeology in this area is this area should be familiar to people from a few years ago. Well, this um, is where ISIS had all their. This is where yes. ISIS was working, isn't it? That's exactly right. This is where ISIS was doing all this stuff. This is the. The, the border of Iraq and Syria here, and there's Raqqa, where the ISIS had their capital city, and they, are, they, they were in control of all this area. And they went around smashing up to pieces every single historical thing they could find. Almost, um, <laughs> almost makes you think and wonder whether, you know, some of our more fanatic uh, friends were aware of what we're talking about right now, uh, long before we were. And uh, they planned very carefully to destroy any evidence which might be uh, uh, pointing uh, uh, people towards uh, the true location of Mecca. Um, very convenient uh, for them and un inconvenient for us, but also worthwhile thinking about. So I, I, that's my thinking of where, where we're going to find the real Mecca. I don't think it's that relevant to the story of Islam necessarily. Um, I think it's there was a, some some group of believers who were hindered in this area, and there was a, a battle which was avoided, and that's all we can know about it. Um, but I think this may be the original Makkah was was around this area, which which fits the description. Okay, well, this has been exciting. Thank you, Joe. This is great to be able to go back. And what we've always said is that we want to look at the evidence that's at hand. Now, what Joe has done. He's taken really two pieces of literature, one, the Byzantine Arabic Chronicle of 741, and the journey of Egeria, is how do you pronounce it? Egeria? Oh, I think it's, I think it's Egeria. I, uh, I Egeria, uh, fourth century AD, from the bishop who is trying to talk about where the Abraham's home was. Now, what, yeah. what, what is fascinating is you've taken both of these art documents, one from the fourth century, one from the eighth century, and you said, what do they tell us concerning not only where Ur is, the Ur, but also why is it that 741 they're using the word Mecca? Why are we so interested in this word? Because this is the first time we see the word Mecca, the name Mecca, anywhere in any annals. Uh, Patricia Kron, mm -hmm. we have to thank her for bringing it to the fore back in 1987. Uh, she didn't go far enough. She should have read a little bit more and tried to then put it and find it on the map what exactly uh, the 741 Chronicle was saying. She was not interested in that, we are, because we would like to see why is it that much of this material, much of these, um, uh, these findings that we see from the Abbasid period actually predate and are much further north in the Umayyad period. What I would say, Joe, is this, have you noticed that both you and Mel have found two different possibilities of where Mecca could be, the original Mecca, the first Mecca. Do you notice they're up in the north? 
Well, of course, yes, they are. They are up in the north, and the key to that is Haran, of course. Um, the identification of Haran and Nisbis. Uh, we we we've got a. Uh, these two cities are helping us identify where these where this is using that Agarius diary. Um, to at least Nisbis is is completely indisputably. There's no question about it that Nisbis is Nusaybin. Yeah. So um, we we Nusaybin. yeah. So we have a very clear idea that it's up here somewhere in the north. And um, when you hear, Muslim I just wanted to point out. Can I just point out one thing, though, um, that when you look at maps for uh, Ur and Orientalis, you will find a lot of um, uh, references to the south of Iraq, because, um, um, of course, those those um, maps which are pointing to Orientalis being in the south of Iraq are, are influenced by uh, Woolsey's discovery of Ur down there and his assumption of that Ur was down there, so which is probably based on the Chaldean uh, tradition that uh, of Tel Ibrahim being the city of Abraham and looking for the a more ancient city of Abraham in, in the south of Iraq. Um, but don't uh, don't what I want, want to try and say is don't be um, don't 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 be too uh, don't don't lack discernment. That's what I want to say. Don't lack discernment when you notice that Orientalis is 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 in this in the southern part of Iraq because those sources which are talking about Orientalis being in the southern part of Iraq are influenced by the already hundreds of years old uh, opinion that Ur is down there. So they identify Ur down there first and then they say the one Orientalis must be down here too because that's the province of where Ur of the Chaldees was. You see, it, it's, it's a bit circular. We've got to make sure that we quote, the, we, we, we quote what the people in that century were saying. It's very clear in the 8th century they believed Ur was much further north. Today, now we know it's much further south. And that's because of Woolsey having discovered, or he wasn't actually the one that did discover it, but he's the one that un, that un, un, uh, that dug up the sands and found the city mm -hmm. and found right. the ziggurat, that huge ziggurat, and found so many of the trinkets and, and uh, many of the artifacts from that time period. Now, the, the, we need to bring this to a close, but what, why is it we're even doing this type of exercise? Simply because the Islamic, the standard Islamic narrative, SIN, standard Islamic narrative, the Islamic traditions have always stipulated that Mecca is in the south. Here's, here's a map. We're going to put a map here. This is where they've always stipulated Mecca has existed. This is where, according to chapter 7, verse 24 in the Quran, this is where Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, which is up in space, down to earth. Eve was thrown down to this city. This is what the standard Islamic narrative says. This is also in chapter 21, verse 51 to 71 of the Quran. It's very clear that Abraham is in the Kaaba. He's going in and he's destroying all the idols. And the understanding is that Abraham also lived in Mecca, way down here, way down here. Why are we bringing this to the fore now? Because the whoever wrote the standard Islamic narrative had an agenda. As Joe has said, that agenda was to eradicate and destroy anything that had gone before. They hated the Umayyads. They wanted nothing to do with the Umayyads. And they wanted their sanctuary to be the sanctuary for all history, for all Muslims. And so by doing that, they are putting Abraham down here in Central Arabia. Nothing existed in Central Arabia in the 7th century or before. There was nothing there at a place called Mecca. We've already shut down Jeddah. We all we now know that Jeddah didn't exist till the eighth century. Looked like Mecca didn't exist till the eighth century in the central part of Arabia. So if you're going to make claims as Muslims have made and as the Quran makes that Eve was way down in the central part of Arabia, so is Abraham living in the central part of Arabia. We're going to dispute that because we're going to look at what the artifacts from history are. What Joe has done, what Mel has done, is to look at artifacts. I, this is exciting what you've come up with, Joe. I like what you've done here. You've looked at two different artifacts. You looked at two different inscriptions. And you said, let's see what they're saying in the 8th century. Let's not redact back from the 1900s uh, from people like Woolsey, what he, uh, what he has now found about Ur. What did they believe in the 8th century? They had not uncovered Ur that early. That was only done in the last century. So this is exciting. Because when you look at a map, when you look at and, and unpack these artifacts, sorry, these inscriptions and put them on a map, you will see that it, uh, you have a very good point. If Sinjar in the, uh, is where the Byzantines believe that, and just south of it is where the Byzantines believe that uh, Abraham lived, and this inscription says that it's between Haran, which is Kara, 
another word for Kara, Haran, and between Sinjar or just south of Sinjar, which is Ur, that would put it. Yeah. That would put it right there within the Nahar al Khaba River. It could be right where that lake is. We don't know, mm -hmm. but it looks like we there. We now that we know that that may be a possibility, we need to start discovering. We need to start unpacking. Well, it'd be great if people would start actually going and seeing if we can even find the uh, the ancient ruins for what used to be Mecca. It looks like also that maybe the Medina that you're coming up with that could be the reason why Yathrib in uh, Saudi Arabia later on in the 8th century was then changed to Medina because of the fact that Mecca uh, would have been just close to Medina. These are all possibilities. We're only putting them out as a white paper. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, this is a what if scenario. Joe has come up with his conclusion. Mel has come up with his conclusion. Now you need to look at both of these and say, which is or which has the better historical corroboration? I'm not going to take a position yet, but I like the fact that there are two good possibilities for Mecca, the original Mecca. What gets me even more excited is that it makes sense that Mecca would be up here because this is where the people lived. This is where all the civilizations existed. Mesopotamia is well known. It is the Fertile Crescent. It is, the, it is where almost all of the Assyrians, this is the Assyrian period, the Babylonians, all of them come from this era and from this area because of those two major rivers. And I would put a third one, uh, the Chabar River, which also made it fertile, the Fertile Crescent for that reason. So if that's where the people lived, if that's where the civilizations came from, then that would make sense that Mecca would exist up there as well. Great stuff, Joe. Yeah, I'm going to give you the last say. It's been great to have you on board. Let's put it out there now. Let's get some responses. The comments are open. We keep the comments open because we want to hear what you're going to say. Do feel free if you come up with any other material, if you have anything to corroborate it, or if you want to dispute it, put it in the comments. But please keep to this subject. Don't go off talking about this, that, and the other that has nothing to do with Mecca. We're trying to find Mecca. We know now it's not down in the Hejaz. It's not down in Arabia. Nothing is really down there than a few hamlets. For the set, If Mecca was this great a city, if Mecca is where uh, possibly, we're not even saying that could Mecca be where Abraham did go through? Possibly. Could that story have been started from that? Right. We don't know. We don't know. He probably, if he's coming from the plain of Shina, which is near just south of Sinjar there, and he's going towards Haran, then he likely did stop in 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 a Mecca on the Khabur River. You know, it's it's a, it's a, there's water there. Even that you know, story of going and destroying all the idols could be perfectly correct. What could be? <laughs> they got the wrong place in the wrong That's period right. at the wrong That's time. Right. Good stuff. Look at the look at the name. Um, Chabor is also similar to Chaybar, which is where the Jews are supposed to be living. Um, uh, down in, in Hijaz, there's a place called Chaybar, and the Chabor River may be where the Jews were living. And even today, there. Well, Chabor could be a def deformation, uh, a deforming of Chaybar, which is yeah. then later became Chaybar down in the Hijaz. All of yeah. these names could have been lifted from this part of the world, which this is part of the world. Her fertile crescent, which is the civilized part of the world, and redacted back down to what is today Arabia, because the Abbasids had a narrative that they wanted to support. They wanted right. all of history to be down there. And once you put a wall of history, you better get the names down there as well. Fascinating okay. point. Thanks, Joe. This also supports what you're saying. Thank you. Well, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is great. We're going to continue. And the next time we're going to get together, I want you to tell me about who do you think Muhammad is? Because Mel thinks right. he knows who Muhammad is. I want then you, when we get to those, when we get to that, I'm going to put Mel's out there. And then I want Joe to come up here and tell me who you think Muhammad is, because you think you may have found him as well. But it's not Ilyas Ibn Kabisa. You think it might be someone completely different. However, he is from up north. I'm just going to leave it there to wet people's eyes. To get them excited, yes. to get them interested. Listen, Joe, I want to thank you for coming on board and helping us with Mecca. This has been exciting for, to not only get your side of the theory, but to actually hear and look at the inscriptions that you forwarded uh, for us, but also to look on a map and see where you think it is. Again, this is a white paper. These are a white paper is what the uh, government does in Britain. They go and they put a white paper out and they leak it to the press. And then they want to see how people respond 
to see if this really is true or if this is something that is not uh, something they should go forward with. And in some ways, this is what we're doing with your material and with Mel's material. White papers to put a what if scenario. But it's to me, I'm almost convinced that you have a really good standing. You have a good case here. I like what you have done. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. God bless you. This is Jay and Joe over and out. Thank you.